It was a chilly winter morning in Ashburn, Virginia, on January 29, 2011. Bethany Ann Decker, a 21-year-old college student and young mother, had been missing for over a week. Her family and friends were growing increasingly concerned, as it was unusual for Bethany to be out of touch for so long. She was known to be responsible and always kept in contact, especially considering she was five months pregnant with her second child. Bethany was last seen on January 29, 2011. After visiting her grandparents' home, she returned to her apartment on Orchard Grass Terrace in Ashburn, Virginia. Her then-boyfriend, Ronald Rolden, claimed he saw her there later that day. This would be the last confirmed sighting of Bethany. Her car remained parked outside her apartment, untouched, and her personal belongings were found inside, as if she had just stepped out for a moment, but she mysteriously vanished without trace. The initial discovery of her disappearance began like any other missing person report, but as hours turned into days, the situation grew more ominous. Local police launched a search operation, scouring the area for any signs of Bethany, but found no trace of her or the child she might have given birth to. The police undertook an exhaustive investigation for several months to locate her, but she left no trace. It ultimately took 10 years to crack the case, which became notorious as one of the most intricate murder and missing person investigations in Virginia. Bethany Ann Decker was born on May 13, 1989, in Fredericksburg, Virginia. She was a bright, ambitious young woman with a promising future ahead of her. Growing up in Virginia, Bethany was known for her friendly demeanor, intelligence, and determination. Her life seemed to be on a positive trajectory as she balanced her responsibilities as a student, mother, and wife. Bethany's early years were marked by her academic achievements and active involvement in various extracurricular activities. She attended Colonial Forge High School in Stafford, Virginia, where she excelled in her studies and participated in the school's soccer team. Her passion for learning and dedication to her goals were evident from a young age. After graduating high school, Bethany enrolled at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. She pursued a degree in global and economic change, demonstrating her interest in understanding and impacting the world around her. Her time at George Mason was characterized by her hard work and commitment to her education. She managed to balance a rigorous academic schedule while also working part-time jobs to support herself financially. In 2009, Bethany met Emile Decker, a member of the Army National Guard. The two quickly formed a close bond and got married later that year. Their relationship appeared strong, and they were soon blessed with a son. However, the demands of Emile's military career meant that he was often away on deployment, leaving Bethany to manage her studies and motherhood largely on her own. Despite the challenges, Bethany seemed to handle her responsibilities with grace. She continued her education at George Mason University and worked as a waitress at Carrabba's Italian Grill in Centerville, Virginia. Friends and family admired her resilience and ability to juggle her various roles. However, beneath the surface, Bethany's life was more complicated than it appeared. Her marriage to Emile was strained, partly due to the long periods of separation caused by his deployments. They had been experiencing marital problems, which were compounded by the stress of managing her responsibilities alone. In the months leading up to her disappearance, Bethany had started dating Ronald Rolden, a man she met through mutual friends. Rolden, who had a history of controlling and abusive behavior, moved in with Bethany in her Ashburn apartment. Their relationship quickly became tumultuous, with Bethany's family expressing concerns about Roldan's influence on her life. They noted that she seemed increasingly isolated and stressed. Bethany's family and friends described Roldan as manipulative and possessive, he allegedly threatened Bethany on multiple occasions, creating a hostile and dangerous environment for her. Despite these red flags, Bethany continued her relationship with Roldan, possibly seeking companionship and support during a difficult period in her life. In January 2011, just before her disappearance, Bethany's husband, Emil, returned from Afghanistan on a brief leave. The couple took a vacation to Hawaii with their son, attempting to reconnect and address their marital issues. However, the trip did not resolve their problems and tensions remained high. Upon returning to Virginia, Emil prepared to redeploy to Afghanistan. On January 29th, Bethany visited her grandparents' home for a family dinner. Afterwards, she returned to her apartment where Roldan was waiting. 
This was the last confirmed sighting of Bethany. Emil left for Afghanistan on February 4, 2011. It was unusual for Bethany not to see him off at the airport, raising concerns among her family. When they tried to contact her over the following weeks, their calls and messages went unanswered. Her family reported her missing on February 19, 2011, after realizing someone was impersonating her on her Facebook account. Someone had been using Bethany's Facebook account to send messages to her friends, creating the false impression that she was still active. Her family quickly realized that these messages were not consistent with Bethany's usual communication style, raising suspicions that someone was impersonating her to cover up her disappearance. When Bethany's family reported her missing on February 19, 2011, the news sent shockwaves through the community. Friends, family, and local residents were deeply concerned, and the case quickly garnered significant media attention. Vigils were held, and volunteers organized searches, hoping to find any clue that could lead to her whereabouts. Bethany's disappearance had a profound impact on her young son. He was just a toddler at the time. He was too young to understand the complexities of the situation. Bethany's parents took on the responsibility of caring for him, providing a stable and loving environment amidst the turmoil. The family made efforts to keep her memory alive, sharing stories and photos to ensure he knew about his mother's love for him. As he grew older, the questions about his mother's fate became more pressing, adding another layer of emotional complexity to the case. The community of Ashburn, Virginia, rallied around Bethany's family, providing support and assistance in the search efforts. The media coverage and community support were crucial in keeping Bethany's case in the public eye. However, despite these efforts, the investigation faced numerous challenges and progress was slow. The initial phase of the investigation focused on understanding Bethany's personal life and relationships. The police interviewed her family, friends, and colleagues, trying to piece together her last known movements and interactions. They learned about her strained marriage with Emil and her volatile relationship with Roldan. Roldan quickly became a person of interest in the case. He was the last person known to have seen Bethany, and his history of abusive behavior raised suspicions. Despite this, Roldan maintained that he had no involvement in Bethany's disappearance and initially cooperated with the investigation. The police also considered the possibility that Bethany had left voluntarily. However, this theory seemed unlikely given her circumstances. She had left behind her car, passport, and personal belongings, and there has been no activity on her bank accounts, email, or phone since January 29th. Furthermore, her close relationship with her son made it improbable that she would abandon him without any explanation. Bethany's apartment on Orchard Grass Terrace became a focal point for the investigation. Forensic teams conducted a thorough search of the premises, looking for any signs of struggle or evidence that might indicate foul play. The apartment, however, was clean and showed no immediate signs of a struggle or forced entry. Her car was parked outside, and her personal belongings, including her purse and passport, were found inside the apartment. Investigators also examined Bethany's electronic devices, including her phone and computer. Her phone records showed the last call she made to her workplace on January 29th. However, there was no further activity on her phone or bank accounts after that day. Emails and social media accounts were also scrutinized, but the only activity was the suspicious messages sent from her Facebook account, which were likely an attempt to mislead her family and friends. Despite extensive forensic analysis and numerous interviews, there were few concrete leads. The clean state of the apartment suggested that if a crime had occurred, it had been meticulously covered up. Forensic teams looked for trace evidence such as hair, fibers, and blood stains, but nothing definitive was found. The lack of physical evidence and the complexity of her personal relationships made the case challenging for law enforcement. As the investigation progressed, detectives developed several theories about Bethany's disappearance. Given the lack of physical evidence and the complexity of her personal relationships, multiple scenarios were considered. One theory was that Bethany might have left voluntarily to start a new life. This idea stemmed from the stress she was under due to her strained marriage the responsibilities of motherhood, and her tumultuous relationship with Ronald Rolden. However, this theory seemed unlikely because Bethany had left behind her car, passport, and personal belongings. 
Additionally, there has been no activity on her bank accounts, email, or phone since January 29th. Her close relationship with her young son also made it improbable that she would abandon him without any explanation. Another theory considered was that Bethany might have been abducted by a stranger. The lack of signs of a struggle in her apartment and the absence of witnesses made this scenario difficult to prove. While random abductions are statistically less common, especially involving adults, detectives could not rule out the possibility entirely. The most plausible theory, according to the investigators, involved foul play at the hands of Ronald Roldan. Roldan's history of abusive and controlling behavior made him a prime suspect. His inconsistent statements during interviews and his behavior raised red flags. Despite cooperating initially, Roldan's responses were often vague and contradictory. This, combined with his criminal history, led investigators to focus on him as the primary person of interest. Given the known volatility of Bethany's relationship with Roldan, investigators also theorized that a domestic dispute might have escalated, leading to her accidental death. Roldan might have panicked and disposed of her body to avoid arrest. This theory was supported by the pattern of domestic violence in Roldan's past relationships and the absence of any signs of Bethany after January 29th. Despite extensive investigations, including searches of nearby fields, parks, and abandoned buildings, the case reached a dead end. Forensic analyses of electronic devices, phone records, and social media accounts did not yield significant breakthroughs. The lack of physical evidence and reliable witnesses made it impossible to build a concrete case against any suspect. The investigation into Bethany Decker's disappearance was fraught with challenges from the outset. One of the primary hurdles was the lack of physical evidence. The clean state of Bethany's apartment, with no signs of forced entry or struggle, left investigators with few clues to follow. Forensic teams scoured the apartment for trace evidence, such as hair, fibers, and bloodstains, but found nothing definitive. This made it difficult to establish whether a crime had occurred inside the apartment or if Bethany had left voluntarily. Another significant challenge was the delay in reporting Bethany's disappearance. She was last seen on January 29, 2011, but her family did not report her missing until February 19, 2011. This three-week gap complicated the investigation, as potential evidence could have been lost or degraded over time. The delay also allowed more time for any potential suspects to cover their tracks. Bethany's complex personal life added another layer of difficulty to the case. Her strained marriage with Emil Decker, compounded by his frequent deployments and her tumultuous relationship with Ronald Rolden, who had a history of abusive behavior, created multiple avenues for investigation. Each relationship had its own set of dynamics and potential motives, making it difficult for investigators to pinpoint a clear suspect. The case had become a cold case until 2014, and the hope of solving this case was lost until... In 2014, the case took a significant turn when Ronald Rolden was involved in a violent altercation with another girlfriend, Vicki Willoughby, in North Carolina. During a domestic dispute, Willoughby shot Rolden in self-defense, resulting in severe injuries to both parties. The altercation took place at Willoughby's home in North Carolina and escalated quickly into violence. Roldan was involved in a heated argument with Willoughby. The argument turned physical, leading Willoughby to shoot Roldan in self-defense. Willoughby later recounted that she feared for her life during the altercation. Roldan had become increasingly aggressive and she felt that shooting him was the only way to protect herself. The incident left both parties severely injured, with Roldan suffering multiple gunshot wounds. He was hospitalized and subsequently arrested for assault. This violent episode was not Roldan's first brush with the law regarding domestic violence. His history of abuse and controlling behavior had been well documented, making this incident particularly alarming for investigators. The altercation with Willoughby underscored Roldan's propensity for violence and reinforced suspicions about his involvement in Bethany Decker's disappearance. Roldan's arrest and conviction for the assault on Willoughby provided investigators with an opportunity to revisit Bethany's case. Detectives from Loudoun County traveled to North Carolina to interview Roldan and gather more information. Although Roldan initially remained uncooperative, the incident with Willoughby bolstered the case against him. It highlighted a pattern of behavior 
that was consistent with the suspicions surrounding Bethany's disappearance. While Roldan was serving time in North Carolina for the assault, detectives from Loudoun County continued to build a case against him. The process of extraditing Ronald Roldan from North Carolina to Virginia was a crucial step in the investigation. Following his conviction for the assault on Vicki Willoughby, Roldan was serving time in a North Carolina prison. In November 2020, Loudoun County authorities filed charges against Roldan for the abduction of Bethany Decker and began the legal process to bring him back to Virginia to face these charges. Extradition involved coordination between law enforcement agencies in North Carolina and Virginia, as well as legal proceedings to secure Roldan's transfer. The process was lengthy and complex, requiring detailed documentation and legal justification for moving Roldan across state lines to face new charges. Despite these challenges, the extradition was successfully completed in November 2020, marking a significant milestone in the case. Following his extradition, Ronald Rolden faced intense scrutiny and pressure from investigators. In December 2020, Rolden was formally charged with second-degree murder in connection with Bethany Decker's disappearance. The mounting evidence against him and the prospect of a lengthy trial eventually led Rolden to plead guilty in November 2022. During his confession, Roldan provided a chilling account of the events that led to Bethany's death. He admitted that on January 29, 2011, he and Bethany had a domestic argument that escalated. In a fit of rage, Roldan pushed Bethany, causing her to hit her head on a windowsill. Panicking when he realized she was not breathing, Roldan decided to dispose of her body instead of calling for help. He placed her body in a Christmas tree disposal bag and put it in the trash compactor at their apartment complex. This confession provided some closure to the case, although Bethany's remains were never found. The legal proceedings against Ronald Rolden were the culmination of years of investigative work and legal maneuvering. Following his extradition to Virginia, Roldan faced charges of abduction and second-degree murder. The prosecution built its case on the evidence gathered over nearly a decade, including digital forensics, witness testimonies, and Roldan's history of violence. Roldan's defense team attempted to mitigate the charges by arguing that Bethany's death was accidental. They contended that while Roldan's actions were reckless, they did not constitute premeditated murder. The prosecution, however, emphasized the pattern of abusive behavior and the deliberate attempt to cover up the crime by disposing of Bethany's body. On February 21, 2023, Roldan was sentenced to 40 years in prison, with 27.5 years suspended as part of a plea deal. He will serve 12.5 years behind bars, followed by five years of supervised release. The terms of his sentence include no contact with Bethany's family and the possibility of extradition to Bolivia after serving his sentence. The sentencing provided a sense of closure for Bethany's family, though the emotional wounds from her disappearance and death remained deep. Her mother, Kimberly Nelson, spoke at the sentencing expressing the sorrow of transitioning from hope for her daughter's return to mourning her confirmed death. The courtroom was a poignant scene, filled with both relief and sorrow as the final chapter of the legal proceedings came to a close. The resolution of Bethany Decker's case, marked by Ronald Rolden's confession and sentencing, brought a degree of closure to a decade-long mystery. But while bringing legal closure, it did little to erase the emotional scars left by Bethany's murder. Her family, who had spent years tirelessly seeking answers, faced the harsh reality of her loss. Bethany's young son, who was just a toddler when she vanished, grew up without his mother, a void that no legal resolution could fill. May she rest in peace. If you found this documentary informative and thought-provoking, please consider subscribing to my channel, Beyond Puzzle. For more in-depth explorations of true crime cases and other compelling stories, your support helps me continue to bring you content that educates and raises awareness. Thank you again for watching. Until next time, stay safe and take care.